This was a really great example of how if you have a vision, if you want to represent your community or work on community politics, you don't have to do what most city councillors do when they just vote yes or no on whatever the city manager puts in front of them. Or uh, they get scared by federal, federal law and think, oh well, even though our community doesn't want to do what the federal government says, well, we have to go by the feds. And we were like, well, F that, you know, we do what we want. We represent 71% of our town, a clear majority, and that we became the first city in the country to legalize medical marijuana. This is my friend Jason, and this is my friends do the coolest sh I moved up to Arcata, California in the early 90s to go to college and got involved in student politics. Idealistic things, you know, we, we ran a pirate radio station in Arcata, that was really cool, but also I was doing things like lobbying actually to stop fee hikes, and I, I studied political science, and spent time going to Sacramento, the capital, and lobbying, but I have people that I really respect a lot of the writings of Chomsky, or things that motivated me from day one. Murray Bookchin, Emma Goldman, all of these classic writers and the, and the social movements that I, I was really inspired with from my early political um, education were things like the Spanish Revolution, what was going on in Barcelona with the CNT, the Zapatistas, all this kind of stuff, so I think people can kind of see my orientation there. This is kind of rare for an anti-authoritarian, for sure. But I have been reading a bit about Murray Bookchin and, and his idea of uh, getting involved in local politics. You know, some of those ideas we're seeing put into place in Kurdish Syria today. But at the time, I was looking at his ideas called uh, confederal municipalism or libertarian municipalism and reading about getting involved in the local level. And then I had all of a sudden this position where I had to meet with a compatriot on the Arcata City Council who was a Republican who the first time I met him, he said, uh, we're, we don't like you students, you're always writing bad checks, we're thinking of banning uh, the ability for students to write checks at all in our town. You all ride your bicycle the wrong way on the one-way street. And I thought, this guy's a bit of a jerk. And I started paying attention and thinking, well, you know, how did this guy get elected to city council? That guy shouldn't even be in office, right? And then before you knew it, our local Food Not Bombs group that had been cooking food daily and serving it to homeless people on the Arcata Plaza, they started to be sued by the city. And this is when I really got involved was thinking, well, maybe you know, one of me or my friends should run for city council. And that was because we found out that the city was spending thousands of dollars on lawyers and police to observe and photograph and document food not bombs with the idea to send them to jail. And me and others said, well, the city, if they're going to spend thousands, they should be spending thousands on feeding the homeless, not um, trying to throw people in prison for doing the job that the city should be doing. And then after discussions with Food Not Bombs and a lot of people around the community, we decided someone needs to run and take this position. And then uh, I don't know exactly how it was decided that I would do it, but we had a big campaign for city council and I won. And I got elected to the city council for a four year term. And then like most cities work, um, after two more years, there was an election and the council chose a new mayor and vice mayor. And I was chosen to be the vice mayor next to a mayor who'd been around a lot longer. one issue that I was kind of successful on that the city had been suing Food Not Bombs before I got there. And then when I got elected, I, I, the first thing I did was, say, was to ask, how much money has the city spent on city attorneys and police? It was $30,000. And I made that public. That had been secret before. And I went public and I said, $30,000 have been spent prosecuting people feeding the homeless when the city should have spent $30,000 feeding the homeless. They got embarrassed, you know, for good reason, and the city stopped the lawsuit. And what happened instead was the city said, oh, Food Not Bombs, you can use our community center kitchen. And that was the, about the only victory I think I had my first two years on the council. And other than that, it was a lot of one against four votes on things I wanted. But then the next time around, three seats out of the five were up for grabs, and we worked to get two more people who were more radical elected. I was working with the Green Party. We actually had a Green Party majority. We became the first Green Party majority in the world. And that really switched things. So it went from being a kind of centrist liberal majority to a slightly more left greenish, more radical majority. And then we did things immediately. Like within six months, we doubled the amount of bicycle lanes. That was a campaign promise I had that I wasn't able to fulfill my first 
two years, but immediately afterwards that happened. Another thing that we did was we said we wanted to build a skateboard park and uh, the state had these laws saying, oh, well, you can't do that because someone could sue the city. So we actually lobbied with other states around California to get the state to change a law so the cities wouldn't be held liable for injuries by skate parks. And we built a skateboard park. And now you see public skateboard parks all over California. And that's because of a law that we got changed from Arcata. You know, a little thing that has a pretty big impact. And then maybe one of the biggest, most significant things was that we became the first city in the country to legalize medical marijuana. It was a really big controversy for us to legalize medical marijuana, and, and that was complicated. At this time, in 1996, there had been some kind of underground medical marijuana place in San Francisco that was kind of tolerated, because also they had a really big HIV crisis and, and a big need for it, and somehow the liberal city council allowed it to happen, but it wasn't legal. And what happened in 96 was that people got on the ballot in California, a medical marijuana initiative, which I believe it passed by something like 51, 52%. But the state was like, hmm, well actually, you know, even though the public won it, we can't go against federal law. So the state kind of threw up their hands, like, we don't know what to do. And in our county, Humboldt County, it was something like 56% of the voters said we want medical marijuana legalized. And in Arcata, I think it was 71% of the public said we want that in Arcata. So me and uh, a majority, or maybe it was even unanimous in the end, we said, we want this here. And me and another city councilor, we went to our police chief and our city manager and we said, we got to do this here. And they told us, well, you know, the city is under, the county is under, the state is under the federal government. We can't do that. But at the same time, we were their bosses, right? And they knew how it worked and they said, okay, we understand more or less. We know we're going to lose our jobs if we don't do it. We had some co-ops, uh, marijuana growing and distribution co-ops start up in the town and we found a way to make it work. This was a really great example of how if you have a vision, if you want to represent your community or work on community politics, you don't have to do what most city councillors do and they just vote yes or no on whatever the city manager puts in front of them. Or uh, they get scared by federal, federal law and think, oh well, even though our community doesn't want to do what the federal government says, well, we have to go by the feds. And we were like, well, F that, you know, we, we do what we want, we represent 71 percent of our town, a clear majority, and, and we legalized medical marijuana. It's called the Green Bike Program, or the Community Bike Program in Arcata. This was inspired by the white bikes or Provo bikes from Amsterdam in the, in the 70s, and we had a few of us together in a small group, and we said we want to make bikes free in, in Arcata, and around this, this time, in the mid-90s, uh, California had some new law, a new, new financing mechanism to deal with CO2 reduction. Something like for every ton of CO2 emissions you reduce, the state's going to give you so many thousand. And we made up this formula and figured uh, somehow we have the statistic that the average person driving to work every day in Arcata drives something like seven miles around trip, something like that. And we figured, okay, if there's 17,000 citizens, half of whom are working, blah, 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 they drive so many times a year, that means we're going to concretely reduce 5,000, something like that, tons of CO2 a year. If we have 100 bikes and just put them out for everyone to ride for free, we estimate every worker is gonna ride once a month. Some figure like that, we just made it up. And we submitted this grant application to the state, and I can't remember what we got, something like $80,000 or something, something incredible. And at this time, a, a car a sales company, I think it was Ford, had moved out of a downtown location. There was this empty building, and the bike program moved in and said, hey, please, people donate bikes you don't need. So people donated tons of bikes, like older folks that didn't ride them anymore. And I think within a couple of months, there were something like 100 bikes just put out on the street. They were all over. Uh, many got stolen, but we factored, factored that in. We just got bikes and we just kept fixing them. That worked fantastically. And also, we turned it into a job trainings program also for high school kids or even at-risk at kids, you know? Kids that needed a skill. Uh, we had volunteer bike mechanics coming in, training kids. They could barely keep up with the donated bikes because it was such a success. That was that was absolutely fantastic. After they found out that bikes were getting stolen more than they expected, they decided to make it what they called a community bike library. So instead of just putting them out for people to take, what they did was say, anybody can come in, just show us your, your ID, write down your name, give us a dollar, and you can check out this bike for a year. And you can renew the bike after a year, but it's your bike. Everybody who wanted a bike had it. 
local level, you know, we had a $60 million budget and I felt like that money belonged to the community and I was managing it. And that's money that I could see. Like, I mean, my friend had a kid, the kid went to the after school program and I was kind of responsible for this budget. So if my friend said, oh, well, they don't have enough toys or what, whatever it was, I could see, oh, well, we can fix that. And that's great, you know, because I think people forget that at the community level, that's something that you can have an impact on. And that's your neighbor and you paying taxes. I mean, no matter who you are, almost, you know, everyone pays taxes, whether it's sales tax or from your, um, your paycheck or your property taxes. Everybody pays taxes. And a lot of people just pay their tax and, like, you know, throw up their hands. Your taxes don't just go to the federal government. In D.C., they go to the state, the county, and your community. It was tough to get elected. It was a campaign, but actually, you know, the campaign was just two or three months. It wasn't like a permanent presidential election in America. And in a town of 17,000, which is pretty small, we had six or 10 people that made it happen. You know, we, we drew up a little map of Arcata, marked some streets in yellow with a highlighter and divvied them up. And I think with six or 10 friends, we covered every door in Arcata within a couple of months. And going from kind of nowhere to a full-fledged campaign within a few months, we we got me elected. And um, I mean, maybe I'm, I like to consider myself halfway smart, but I'm not necessarily the best candidate, you know. I encourage people, if you're in a small community especially, get out and run and uh, take power. You know, a lot of anti-authoritarians say, we want to smash power, but uh, things like Noam Chomsky writes, he says that actually campaigning for public health care is in our best interests as anti-authoritarians. If you look at what the Kurds are doing in Syria with self-management, how they're doing it. This is a really inspiring model, and you see some committed uh, anarchists or anti-authoritarians going to Syria to work with the Kurds. Well, learn from them or read about that and take those lessons and bring them back here. You know, they took, they took those ideas from Murray Bookchin in, in the U.S., you know? Let's keep thinking about what's working and make it happen, and you can make it happen where you live, too.